That's and right. I've read messages that that said, uh, Jesus, aren't you listening to me? But he does, but he answers in his time, and sometimes we don't have patience. So anyway, we'll try our best. <laughs> I want to read today. Carrie, would you read Joshua 24, 15? And Connie, would you read, uh, let's see, down here in my, in my eyesight, Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2. And let's see. Jeanette, would you read Daniel 1, 4? And then um, Luke chapter 15, verse 14. Jim, can you read that one? Luke 15, 14. Resolutions. A lot of people make them. We do it with our human flesh. Um, and that's why we, so many people don't keep resolutions. We've probably all done it and not kept them. Um, we say, I'm going to do this, I vow to do this, I vow to exercise or do this or this or this, and that's, there's nothing wrong with it. What I'm saying is with our human minds, our, our will, the song fits perfect. That the Lord changed your song because with our will we want to do something but if we let the Lord say if we say Lord don't give up on me Jesus we can get it done 
But so many times as human beings, what do we try to do? We do it on our own. We've all talked about it before. We've all done it. So we'll have try to figure out a problem. Um, whether it's trying to find a bolt. I've done it so many times working on a car before I had a garage, before I had a driveway that was paved. You always drop a bolt or a washer or something you need on a car in the grass or in the gravel. How many guys have ever done that? How many women have ever done that? <laughs> you drop something, you can't find it. I told you years ago, um, I got the idea from Mike because he used to take a magnet and pick up drywall screws because they threw them all away where he worked. He just went through and picked them up and reused them. He gave me a big bin of them one time. I used a bunch of them. So I took a magnet and I have it in my workshop. And I've had my work, and before I had a garage, I had it in my, in my toolbox. You drop most of the stuff on cars. Some There's some aluminum parts, but most of them have steel and iron in them, and you take that magnet to run over the grass, all of a sudden you hear this click! And you find the washer, the screw, the nut, whatever it was you dropped. But before, when I used to do that, I'd look around for 20 minutes or 10 minutes or 13 minutes or 5 minutes, and then you know what I'd do then? Lord, help me find that. What should I have done first? Lord, help me find that. But we all, we've all been there. So how many resolutions have we already been made or will be made for this year? Um, show that next slide. Read that. <laughs> okay, Loretta admitted it's her. How many else would... Do it that way, do the treadmill. Come on, anybody? Hey, did chickens. You big chicken. Is that the easy way to be on a treadmill? Yeah. <laughs> the doctor told me to do it, Tom. Spend the time on a treadmill. I like the videos where the guys get on there and they fall all over. We want to go into that. But doing what the doctor said, you know, obeying the doctor's orders, take a little out of context. So we're going to talk about some men in the book, people in the Bible who made resolutions. Um, we make resolutions time and time again. We make resolutions, and some resolutions are limited. Um, doing better can't save us, can't help us. Works don't commend us to God. Um, the value of resolutions it depends on how we do them. So let's start with Joshua. Chapter 24, verse 15. Read that verse. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Connie gave me that plaque, that verse in Swahili. I have it over my door in my office. We have that verse at our house of plaque. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Of course, Becky and I met in Bible college. Literally met. She, I was holding the door for her, and she ran into me. wasn't paying attention. Uh, she ran into me. Uh, she saw this handsome guy. She just figured I've got to meet him somehow. I'll just run into him. Uh, but, uh, so we met and all that, you know, you know, the whole story behind that. So we met in Bible college, and we... we we're serving the Lord anyway. We're both in Bible college, both going to go into the ministry. But we resolved in our lives that as for us and our house, we will serve the Lord. You are here today. Many of you have been serving the Lord practically all your lives. Some not as long. Some got saved later. Dale got saved later. Some others got saved later. But some of you, many of you, that's all you know is serving the Lord and going to church and doing what God wants you to do. Uh, and that wasn't just a resolution, and it, it, although it is, some of you went to church because your parents told you to go to church. Your parents drug you to church. Uh, they made you go to church. You didn't like it, but you had to go. But now your parents turn around and you still go. Well, turn the child the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. So God, you know, his, his, his choice, talking about Joshua, his choice, as you see this next slide, his choice was to serve God. Uh, the lot, word in there could have been choice that I, that, you, that, I, that I could underline. We make choices every day. You get up in the morning, you decide whether you want to sleep in late or not. You decide whether you what you want for breakfast. 
Uh, one of the guys I work with who died a couple years ago, Mike knows him, Dick. His wife fixed him bacon and eggs five days a week for over 20 years for breakfast. Now, I like bacon. Bacon goes with anything. Anybody here not like bacon? Anybody? I was going to say you need to come to the altar if you don't like bacon. Uh, bacon goes with anything, but I like bacon and eggs. But I like a variety. I think I get tired of it every day. Bacon and eggs, bacon and eggs, bacon and eggs. He went to Taco John's four days a week. When the truck pulled into the lot, they said, Dick's here, and they'd make his lunch, have it ready, and walk up the counter. All he ordered two tacos and a drink. Never got anything different. Well, on Fridays, he decided, well, it's paid out. Go get something different. He might go somewhere else and get something. Um, but I like a variety of things. But Joshua, he made a choice. The choice, the choice was to serve God. Look at the next slide. God never forces someone or anyone to serve him. Um, as parents, sometimes we have to force our children to do things they don't want to do. Uh, we've all, as those of you who are here, you think back to your childhood. Every one of us were probably at one time bucked what our parents wanted us to do, and we argued with them. We didn't want to do it. I, I remember which one time, it's my job to mow the yard. We live in Ohio. It's my job to mow the yard. You know, when you get to be 11, 12 years old, 13 years old, you get to do that good stuff. And I argued with him, and I, I don't want it. I didn't want to push that mower back and forth because we didn't have a gas mower. We couldn't afford it. That mower that goes back and forth, and the wheel rolled around, and it wasn't. It was never sharp. We didn't know what sharp was back then. And I argued with him one time. I better argue with him for two hours. Guess what I ended up doing? I ended up mowing the grass. I could have had it done. You know, that yard was a human big enough. It took, if I remember right, it took about an hour to do it, an hour, hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes. That two hours I argued about it, I could have had it done, but then I got grounded because I argued about it. So then I lost more time. I was in a way forced to do it, but God never forces us to serve Him. He will never force anyone. He will not put you, you in a chokehold. He will not tie you up. He will never force you to, to serve Him. So what will your choice be this year? What is your choice going to be? Will you serve God? Or will you serve the devil? Now you say, that's an awful odd question. What happens if we don't do what God wants us to do? If He tells us to do something, what happens? What are we, who are we serve? Who are we serving if we're not serving God? Ourselves? No, we're serving the devil. He's the one that's given us that, that idea. He's the one that wants us to do the opposite. Satan wants to stop this world. He wants to stop Christianity. He is doing everything he can. I listen to sermons all the time like Dale. And, and the, these preachers keep talking about this. The devil's trying to do everything he can. Everything he can to stop the church. But guess what? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. He's doing everything he can to stop the church, but the church is still thriving. Um, I don't know if you saw the story or heard about it. There was a video. Five Islamists killed five Christians on New Year's Day. Had a picture of them there on their knees, blindfolds on, and shot them for being Christians. Shot them in the head. Just killed them. They did nothing wrong. They weren't Muslims. And they killed him. They say, yeah, this is, this is what God wants us to do. God says for us to kill the infidels, and they, they killed him. Well, it wasn't good that the Christians died, but guess what? Where are they at now? They're in heaven. They're in heaven. Now, yes, their families are probably hurting, but they're in heaven. So God is not going to force us. There is, you know, there's no middle ground in the service of God. You... You've heard it before. You can't straddle the fence. You can't say, well, I'm going to serve God on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm not going to. You, you can't do that. God is not pleased. He wants us to give Him everything. He wants us to serve Him with everything. So that's Joshua's resolution. David's resolution, Psalm 116, verses 1 and 2.
So here again, David made a choice. His choice was to pray. You go through the Psalms and you find out all these prayers of David talking to the Lord. Bless me, O Lord. Lead me, O Lord. Guide me, O Lord. He says, thank you, Lord. All these things that David talks to, all these times he talks to the Lord, because you look back at his life, he was not a perfect person. Of course, none of us are. But he failed the Lord miserably a few times. But he decided, okay, Lord, touch my heart. Touch my life. I resolve that even though I failed you, I'm going to serve you. He gives his reasons behind his choice to pray because God hears and answers prayer. Now, that's for all of us. God hears our prayers and he answers them. He does not, like Ann said, he does not, and you all know this, he does not answer them all the time the way we want them. A lot of kids ask for a lot of things at Christmas time. They probably didn't get everything. They probably didn't get everything they wanted. We bought Gage a, a drone. Kinsey said the other day, I want a drone. Said, you got money? She got money for Christmas. She has, we have a wall at our house. They have money in each one of them, have some money. And I said, take your money and buy you a drone. She said, I want one with a camera on it. Um, so take your money, buy you a drone. So Randy called her today and said, we're going to build a bear because Kinsey wants a unicorn. So she spent most of her money on a unicorn. Because at build a bear some of you have probably never been there, you can pick your animal and then they fill them up, but then they have these things you can add to them. Hers has, a, if you touch this thing, it has a heartbeat. She put the thing in for the heartbeat. She put the, the other thing in there that makes a, a whinny sound like a horse. And then she put another thing in there that has a scent. All those cost extra. Then she bought a tutu for it. And she bought shoes for it. And she bought a cell phone for the unicorn. <laughs> not a real one. Right. It's not a real one. Oh yeah. She spent $80. It's her money. She got the money for Christmas and her birthday. She can spend it how we want. They, they, that's fine. I said, Kenzie, I thought you wanted a drone. Well, what are the unicorn more? That's fine. Kids ask for a lot of things. These kids today ask for things that cost a lot more than when we were kids. Am I right? Amen. <laughs> they want two, three, four, five, six hundred, a thousand dollar electronic things. They want all kinds of things. They want things that cost a lot more than what they did when we were kids. And some of them get it, but I doubt that most kids probably didn't get everything they wanted. So, he so chooses to, pray, to praise God at all times, according to Psalm 34, 1. Um, there is an, an, an excellent example for us to follow. We need to continue to pray because prayer is important to our relationship with God. I should have put that up there. Prayer is important to our relationship with God. The communication is what we need. Now, prayer time is when we stop and we, you may be in your prayer closet, you may be in your room by yourself, you may not have to close your eyes. When we pray in a corporate situation like this, what do we do? We bow our heads, we close our eyes. A missionary was in, in Peru one time and he was asking the people who just got there to learn the language. He said, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. And he said, bow your eyes and close your head. And everybody was still looking at him. They, they, he finally, they finally told him, he said it backwards. Uh, but we bow our heads, we close our eyes, because these minds of ours, how many of your minds wander once in a while? Raise your hand if your mind wanders. Even when you're praying. I've heard preachers say, well, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You're a terrible sinner if your mind wanders when you pray. We're human beings. Now, don't, that's not an excuse, but anything in a group like this, one thing happens, and of course you know the devil does it. He'll cause, I believe, he'll cause something to stir. He'll cause a child to cry. Or he'll cause something to happen to get somebody's mind off of God. But we close our eyes. We bow our heads. Now you may be in your own prayer closet. And you may not close your eyes. You may just read your Bible. You may study your Bible. You may just pray out loud. That's your choice. But you're choosing to do it. That's communication with God. The prayer time, then there's talking to God that's communication, just like anybody who lives in other couples, 
They need to communicate with one another to learn about one another. I told you before, we talked about it. A young couple starts dating, and dating the dating process is to learn about the other person. Of course, you don't really know them until you move in with them. Then you find out how they really are. Uh, but because then you find out they put the toilet paper going out instead of in like you wanted, you know, uh, on all kinds of other things. And then uh, we want to get into all that. But you, you get the picture. We, we, we have to pray. God wants us to pray. He wants to communicate. Couples have to have communication or, or what happens? They, they separate. They separate if there's no communication. What happened with Adam and Eve in the garden? Sin came along and there was this wall there and they weren't communicating with God. They were, they were in fine fellowship with God. All of a sudden, they disappeared. What did God say to Adam? He said, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Did God know where Adam was? Did God know he's hiding behind the bush, to hide behind the tree? Of course he did. He knew where he was, but he wanted to test him. Adam, where art thou? He said, I was naked and I hid myself. Well, until sin came along, he didn't know that nakedness was, was wrong. It's not in God's eyes, but he said, okay, I'm naked and I hid myself. Because it's sin. Well, prayer, that communication was gone. That's an excellent example for us to follow. We need to continue prayer because prayer is important in our relationship with God. Look at the things you probably already see on the screen there. We need to determine to praise Him because of a couple things. Number one, you cannot complain and praise. You can't do that. I heard a preacher say this week, if you have time to worry then you have time to pray. That's right. Amen. Think about it. That's right. Oh, I sit here, I'm going to twirl my thumbs, I'm going to worry about this. Well, instead of worrying about it, take it to the throne. Yes. Here, Lord, I need you. Yes. Here it is. We need to continue to praise Him, as we said, because you cannot complain and praise. You cannot criticize and praise. You cannot gossip and praise. You can't do these things and honor the Lord. I've said so many times, when God wants us to do something, we need to do it. David's resolution concerning God's word, Psalm 119, 15, and 16, we won't read those. He said, I will meditate in thy precepts. Now this is after, after David had sinned against God more than once. But he said, I'm going to meditate in thy precepts. I'm going to meditate in thy precepts. I remember it was Wednesday night I told him, or, or, or somebody else, but I think it was Wednesday night, but uh, I listened to her preacher this week. He said when he was in, he was in college, living in California, he was in charge of the group that, that got together and prayed in the morning for classes. So he had been studying this verse on prayer, and he had been meditating for about a week on this verse on prayer, and how God answers prayer, but he's meditating on the fact of the power of prayer. Yes. You know, Paul and Silas were in jail, they got released because of prayer. They were praising and praying God, praying and praising God. Well, he says, how he was he was meditating on this, this thing of praise and this thing of prayer and the power of it. He said he got up that morning, he was up there, he was up there behind the pulpit. He said he was getting ready to pray. He said he's, he told everybody, I've been talking about, thinking about this and studying this verse. And he said, there's power in prayer. And he said, he had his eyes closed. He started praying. It's like this. All of a sudden, the pulpit started shaking. <laughs> and he said, in my mind, I thought, he said, at first, in my mind, I thought, wow, I'm praying so good. Good boy, the Holy Spirit, he's got a hold of this pulpit. And he's just shaking it. And he kind of opened his eyes. And there was a couple people at the altar. And there was other people, and their eyes are wide. All of a sudden, the whole building was shaking. It wasn't the power of prayer. It's called an earthquake. But he had in his mind at first. He thought, boy, I'm, I'm so close to God. I'm, my prayer is so powerful. He's just shaking his pulpit like this. Whoops. <laughs> Knock my water down. Prayer is powerful. Yes. If God Amen. could come down right now, he could shake this building. Yes. Prayer. He wants us to communicate with him. So David said, I'm going I'm to dwell on your concepts. He said, I will delight myself in your statues. He said, I will not forget thy word. Raise up a child in the ways you go. Train up a child in the ways you go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. 
When you get the Word of God impacted in your life, imparted in your brain, placed in your heart, part of your life, you dwell on it. You serve the Lord. You sing praises to Him. You go to church. You, you do Bible study. All this, you put it all together, and you're not going to forget it. God wants us to make Him number one in 2021. God wants us to make Him number one, not just on Sundays. He wants to be in charge. So, what about a resolution of Daniel? Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the times of the children. So he decided, Daniel decided to remain separated. In this whole discourse, read Daniel chapter 1. The king made a decree to do a whole bunch of different things, and especially to pray to him at a certain time. Daniel decided, you know what? God says I am to only honor him. I am to only bow down to him. I am to only lean the knee to him and not anyone else. He made a resolution that I'm going to be separated. I'm going to give my heart to God. I'm going to let Him take care of everything. So he decided to remain separated in serving the Lord. He refused to defile himself with the, 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 the meat and the drink. If you read the whole thing, he was supposed to eat certain things, and, and he refused. Though other people around him did it, uh, thinking that there's nothing else they could do, uh, Daniel refused. There are times that we... Okay, let me read the next thing first. Right is right, even if one person, even if someone else is doing it, and wrong is still wrong, even if everybody's doing it. So right is right, even if only one person is doing it. Is that right? If God says this is it, if only one person is doing it, is that right? Of course it is. If a thousand people are doing what's wrong, it's still wrong. You probably did it. I probably did it. Your children do it. There comes a point in their life and their time they get to be teenagers. I'm going to do this and you say no. Well, John and Jay and, and George and Fred and Harry and Mary and, and Sylvia and you know, all that. Well, they're doing it. It doesn't make it right. Well, these Christians over here, they're doing it. Doesn't make it right. This Christian over here, he tells lies all the time. Doesn't make it right. This Christian over here, he steals. Or, you know, whoever it is, if God says it's wrong, it's wrong, period. Yes. If God says it's right, it's right, period. Doesn't matter. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You don't even have to believe it. God said it, and it settles the whole thing. But Daniel decided, I'm going to be separate. I'm going to do what is right. Daniel took a stand for the Lord. He could have had an easier way. As a matter of fact, if you look at the whole story, read Daniel chapter 1, it would have been easier for him not to stand for the Lord. You read the whole story of Daniel, it would have been easier for him not to stand with the Lord. What did the king ultimately do to Daniel? Where did he place him? Where? In a lion's den. Most of us, if we got placed in a lion's den, that lion have a good lunch. Or some of us, he might spit out. I don't know. Uh, but when you put a human being with a wild animal, they usually don't mix. Now, there's going to come a time when the lions will lay down with the lamb. But they put Daniel in there with the lions, and they sat there and let Daniel pet their mane. Imagine what they thought when they saw that. Imagine what they thought when they saw that. I told you a few weeks ago what they used to do in Rome. You know, they just put them out there, the Colosseum. They put, they used to put Christians out in the middle and just let the lions loose and just devour them. And I told you that if you look at the story, look in history, they they repeatedly wrote that as these Christians were being devoured, they didn't complain. They didn't 
scream. They didn't gripe. They probably screamed with pain, but they didn't gripe about it. They didn't, they didn't complain. They just said, thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. I'm doing it for you. And people from the stands, other Romans got up and they went out on that in the Colosseum and let those lions destroy them. They probably got saved. They probably resolved their lives to the Lord. They said, if these Christians have this much faith, it's got to be something to it. That's a testimony. Daniel had a testimony. Daniel was purposed in his heart that he was going to serve the Lord. His decision was not just a, a whim, but he made a personal conviction. Now, God will give us different, one of us, different convictions. We have to have some heartfelt convictions in our lives. We wanted, we were convicted, the Lord wanted us, we felt the Lord wanted us to have our children in Christian school. And we did that. And Randy finally his second year of high school went to South. But for all their young lives, they were in a Christian school. There were people here at church that made fun of us. They made fun of our kids. You don't need to know who. Doesn't matter. Other Christians. Your kids need to be in a Christian in a, in a in a public school. We felt God wanted them in a Christian school. We had to do what God convicted us on. I've had people tell me that God's convicted me, tell me to do this thing, even though it's wrong. God's telling me to do it. He can't do that. God cannot tell you to sin. Not one time. He can never tell you to sin. Now our minds, we can convince our minds of all kinds of things. We can convince ourselves of all kinds of things, okay? But we must purpose in our hearts and our lives to be holy before God. That doesn't mean perfect. Holy lives are not a result of just chance. They're purposed. Holy means to be set aside for God's purpose. To be set aside for God's use. Now, we don't understand every day what happens or why things happen. We, there's none of us that understand everything that happens, just like Dale said. There are Christians that get sick. There are Christians that have things happen. There are Christians that have hard times. There are Christians that have hard lives. The song says, I never promised you a rose garden. God never said it would give you everything perfect. But he said, I'll walk with you along the way. He said, I'll hold your hand. I'll, I'll have your hand. As a matter of fact, as the footprints fall, he said, I'll carry you. And we need that. So many times in our lives, we need God to carry us. But these holy lives set aside for God. And then one last verse, the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15, verse 14. He came from a, the prodigal son came from a well-to-do family. He decided one time, he said, okay, I want my, I want my inheritance now because I want to go out and I want to go out into the world and I want to live like the devil. I want to live it up. I want to go eat steak and of course probably already had steak. Said, I want to go out and do whatever I want, whenever I want. I don't want to have to answer to anybody. I want to go out and I want to have a good time because it sure does look good on the other side of that fence. So he did. And he gets to the point of the verse where we see he had spent all. He wasted everything that he had. In our day, or let me back up a little bit. Jim, when you were 10 years old, would you have thought $1,000 was like a million dollars? <laughs> Boy, back then, well, in 74, I believe, Mom and Butch bought a brand new Vega. $2,995. Now, if you took our economy now, would you, how many of you would be more than glad to go out and pay $2,995 for a brand new car? I'm not talking about a, a Hot Wheels car either. Go out and buy it now. The Vegas weren't the best car. They had a lot of problems with aluminum and all that, but I'm not talking about that. But for $3,000, you had bought a brand new car. In our economy today, most people could probably come up with that, get a loan for it, whatever. $3,000 would be nothing. There are some cars, it costs $3,000. Matter of fact, Becky's car, the radio and the GPS, all one unit. 
Of course, it's under warranty still when we did it. Started putting, even though it was made here in the United States, started putting Korean messages on the screen. It wouldn't go off. So they said the radio was bad. So they replaced it. Just that radio and the GPS. Somebody tell me, anybody know think, how much you think that would cost? $3,500 for a car radio and the GPS and the book on that thing is about half as thick as my Bible. I got one page when I had a child. I'm serious, the book on that's that thick on the radio and the GPS. $3,500. Morty paid for it. They replaced it. Haven't had trouble since. That's the whole purpose of a warranty. Imagine what things were. He had a lot of money. So he took out his money, he took it out, and he, and he, and he, he spent it all. He decided, I'm going to spend it all, I'm going to have a good time, and he got to the bottom. He got all the way to the bottom. He got where he had, it said he had nothing. That's pretty low. That's pretty far down to have nothing. Some of you have probably been there to have nothing. We've been there. I told you, Ryan Little lost my job. We were at church that day. We had a bag of beans and baby food for Ryan. That's all we had in our apartment. Beans would go for a few meals, but that's all we had. I could have made a phone call. My father-in-law said, we need some food. In fact, before that, we had needed money, and I went and pawned my router. Becky got on the phone, and she was crying. She said, Rick went and pawned his router to buy meat so we could have some food. And he sent us the $35 so I could get the router back out. But I could have called him, but, you know, the Lord took care of it. When church that night, they had a food shower for us. Does God take care of his people? Sure he does. We didn't have anything. You've all been there. Most of you have been there. Don't have much. Some of you don't know what it's like. Too bad. I'm serious. So when he finally reached the bottom, he saw life in the proper perspective. Probably, as I, I should have put this on the slide, probably for the very first time. Of course, we say, when you get down to the bottom and you're laying flat on your back, which way can you look? There's only one way to look is up. God let him do what he wanted to do. So he made a resolution. He made a resolution to return to his father to confess his sin. Now, as God does, you know the story. You've got one more slide here, but you know the story. The father was waiting and kept looking. He kept anticipating. Well, Randy lived with us a few years ago, and um, him and Sarah separated, and he stayed with us for a while. He had a dog named Sarge. That dog loved Randy. Everywhere Randy went, that dog was with him. He said, come on, Sarge. They'd get in the car and ride everywhere with him. One day, Randy was gone for, I don't know, three or four hours. He was working. He was gone four or five hours, whatever. And that dog sat on the couch, sat up there in my lap or Becky's lap, but he, he sat there the whole time, and guess where his eyes were? Out the kitchen window. Every time uh, if a truck come on there that started coming down the street, they saw a truck that looked like Randy's, that dog jumped down, he waved at the front door, and said, that's not him, Sarge. He'd finally get back up on her lap. He'd pout. He'd sit there. That dog kept sitting there, and every time he heard a car, his ears perked up. He thought it was his master. And boy, was he glad when Randy, and I, he was a little trouble. That, that dude could jump that high. He could almost jump up to the counter. He, he, he knew Randy. When Randy's truck pulled in the driveway, he was over there by the door jumping up and down. He was bouncing like a kangaroo. He was bouncing like a kangaroo. Last Sunday, Randy had to work. Just to, I think we had to, I don't know if had salt stuff, whatever. He had to run around so the kids were at our house and they're making cookies. But And they knew Randy was coming, but every two minutes they're at the table. Every two minutes, Gage kept looking out the window. He wanted to see his dad. He wanted to see his dad. The prodigal son, his father standing there, and he just kept probably every day. He, he probably stood at that driveway every day looking out to see if his son was coming down the driveway. 
You know what God does? He stands there every day watching for us. He, he's waiting for us to come to Him. He's waiting for us to give Him a little bit of time. We've got to wrap this up, but He's waiting for us to give Him a little bit of time. The Father standing there, He said, Go get the fat and kill the fat and calf. Get the purple garments. Guess what? My son's come home. And he greeted him with open arms. The prodigal son decided he's going to confess his sin. He said he's going to go back to his father. His greatest resolution was to become a humble servant. Humility. That's all God wants from us. We don't serve him for the prophets. Now, there's a great profit in serving the Lord. One of these days, the eastern sky is going to split. We're going to hear a trumpet. The day of Christ arrives first, and we which are alive remain, shall be caught up to that, be ever with the Lord. Do you believe he's coming back? Amen. What do you say he's going to? Now, if we aren't taken in the rapture, he may take us by death. Paul said the absence of the body is to be present with the Lord. When I die, I'm going straight to heaven. The story I told you last week about the couple who died and then the, mother, the wife had her hand in the husband's hand and the husband died and the daughter said, well, he's not dead. His heart's still beating. And the nurse said, that's the resolution from her heart going through his heart into the monitor. And I said, that's how God does. He holds our hand. I forgot to tell you that then the, the I thought of it later, the daughter said, you know what, I know my dad. Because ten minutes later, the mom, the, her mother died. He said, Dad, he's standing outside the pearly gates waiting on mom because they're going to walk in together. They're going to walk in together. All God wants is our humble service. He wants us to say like Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send me. Use me. So let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. As far as I know, everyone in this building is a born-again Christian. If you're watching this by video, if you're not a born-again Christian, you can accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can just say a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I ask you to forgive my sins. I want to serve you. I make a resolution to give you my life. And he will come into your heart instantly. Christian, Let's make a resolution, but not a human resolution, not on the human side, but on a spiritual side. Let's make a resolution to serve God this year with everything we have. Father, we want you to be our guide. We don't know what's going to happen in this year. We didn't know what was going to happen last year. We stood in, on the first Sunday last year, the first month of last year, the first two months of last year, everything was normal. And then March and April hit, and the whole world was turned upside down. We had no idea. But we also know that you're still in charge. So we're asking you to guide us during this year, to bless us, to use us, to strengthen us, to draw us closer to you, that we might be a blessing to you. Bless as we leave this place today that you will use us. May you place someone in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, place someone in front of us that we can be a blessing to, that we can be a witness to and a testimony. Use us, Lord, and all God's people said.